I'm Steve Bays. I'm a biologist here at Ottawa University. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the current happenings of the tsunami and earthquake in Japan. Uh, one of the classes that I'm involved with, besides biology classes, is teaching an interdisciplinary course on disaster response and assessment. Uh, as part of that class, of course, that's very pertinent. We're trying to make sure that students have an opportunity to learn how they can help their local community. This is the fifth largest earthquake in 100 years. Can you offer some perspective comparing the Chile and Haiti earthquakes to this one? Okay. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, earthquakes are measured, of course, with the Richter scale. Most of us are familiar with that. But what we might not realize is that each time the magnitude goes up one number, it's actually 10 times stronger. So the, Haitian, the earthquake in Haiti in Port-au-Prince was a 7.7 .7 magnitude. This was an 8.9 magnitude. That means that this is over 100 times stronger than the earthquake that ha happened in Haiti. In the news, we keep hearing reports that Japan is in what is known as the, rain, the ring of fire. Can you explain what the ring of fire is? Sure. We have this map with us here. If we think about the Earth's crust covering the whole Earth, it's broken up into blocks, and these blocks are referred to as plates. Well, North America and about halfway through the Atlantic Ocean is one large plate. Another very large plate is over here in the Pacific Basin. That continues until it hits with this Eurasian plate. Well, when these plates come together, there's a lot of stress, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, things that way. Because of the volcanic activity that borders the ring of the Pacific here, that's referred to as the ring of fire. How do these borders cause earthquakes? Well, we have some Play-Doh model over here. and I know, that's real high tech, but it gets the point across. If we think of these as being two different masses, this one we're going to pretend is our Pacific Basin uh, plate, and this we're going to pretend is our Eurasia plate. If we start pushing those two together, see that one is going to tend to slide under the other. We have some mountain building, but they also stick. And every so often, if we keep pushing, they slip. Well, each time it slips, that's an earthquake. The, the more it slips, the greater the magnitude of that. In the past few years, there seem to have been many earthquakes. In your opinion, do you think that there are more than usual? Yeah, there seems to be recently kind of a, a, a surge in the number of earthquakes that are happening, and particularly in larger earthquakes. I don't think it's clearly known as to whether this is a, a temporary trend or whether there's something larger with it. But this is, these are natural processes of the Earth and the Earth's, Earth's crustal movement. We shouldn't be reading into that, that this has anything to do with concepts like global warming that might be related to hurricane activity, but it's not going to be related to movement of the Earth's plates. Can you explain how earthquakes and tsunamis are related? Okay, if we come back to here and we talked about this movement, we see that one of those plates is being pushed up. If this earthquake is happening close to a coastline or out in the ocean, that movement means that there's a volume of water over there that's also being moved. And as this surges upward, it moves a tremendous amount of water. Well, that water now spreads away in both directions, and as it comes into a coastline, the coastline is sloped. And so as the water comes in, there's no place for it to go except for upward. So it basically becomes compressed, tighter and tighter, and elevated higher and higher in terms of a wave that's coming into the shore. Do you think that this tsunami is stronger than the one that hit Southeast Asia in 2004? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure that the numbers are in yet accurate enough that we can make those kind of judgments. It would appear it's not quite as strong as the Indian Ocean tsunami, but probably more important is the economic situations that the countries affected find themselves in. The 2004 tsunami in Indonesia and in Indian Ocean hit many countries that have low economic status. As a result of that, there is no warning system there. 
Japan benefits from being a, a affluent country and having a tsunami warning system. The United States as well. We have warning systems that allow us to know that that's coming across. For the United States, it takes somewhere between 10 hours or so for, for the tsunami to travel across the Pacific Ocean. And so there's time to warn people to allow for evacuations. In Indonesia, there is a very high population very close to the coastline, very close to where the, where the earthquake, where the epicenter was, and so there was very little time for evacuation, and then lack of communication systems made it even more difficult. Japan has many nuclear power plants, and um, their largest one was actually affected pretty heavily by the earthquake, and we keep hearing references in the news to um, the cooling wasn't working. So what does cooling mean in reference to nuclear power plants? Nuclear power plants work by having a, a large enough mass of, of radioactive fissionable material to keep a chain reaction going. These chain reactions create a tremendous amount of heat. That's a good thing if you're generating power because you use that heat, that steam that's generated, to run your turbines. But on the other hand, if that water is no longer being able to be circulated to cool the reactor chamber, the concern is, is that that reactor chamber can get too hot and actually start to melt. If it starts to melt, then that means that radioactive steam could potentially be released into the atmosphere. In the news reports that I've seen to this point, the, the, while the officials are evacuating areas around it, it's a relatively small area that they're evacuating. So that would hint at that they don't feel that there's really very high risk of it breaching the containment walls for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point, I think, you know, again, they're engineering, um, their standards of, of control and safety are high enough that I don't think we need to worry about a breaching of the reactor core. It goes back to that, the fact that Japan has been very well prepared and they've got the right architecture and engineering. And right. They, they to, have prepared for these yeah. scenarios to happen mm -hmm. um, in preparation, in practicing. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all things that help them to be able to recover, hopefully much more rapidly than what we have seen for Haiti.